Well, here we are for our next episode of Living Legends. And this is our first Zoom edition. Uh, we have one of our amazing connections. Uh, used to connect with our church, has recently moved. I am so excited to have Altavis Ewing with us. Come on, Altavis. Tell me first, let's start off. Where are you? Where are you at in the world now? Yes. So thank you, Pastor Jason, for inviting me back. It's so great to connect with my Emmanuel family, um, which has a big piece of my heart still. Um, so I am actually back in my home state now. I'm back in the fabulous state of Tennessee. Um, and specifically, I'm in the Memphis, Tennessee area now, um, which is familiar territory for me. I actually went to college in Memphis, Tennessee. Um, I went to Rhodes College. So it, it's good to come back and really instantly plug into a network um, that I left a few years ago. Wonderful, wonderful. Now, I, I must I must admit, you are one of our youngest living legends. Uh, and, and I hope that that doesn't you know, blow your head up too much, but you really are doing some absolutely amazing stuff in the area of genetics and genetic counseling. So let me, maybe let's start off with this big question. What is genetic counseling? Yes, um, and great question. And maybe before I answer that question, I can say I, I truly am honored to be featured on the Living Le Legends um, series. It was very intimidating um, when Sister Kasun um, gave me that call and asked me and my, my instinct was to say no. Um, but, but I thought about it and I was like, I don't want to end up in the belly of a whale. So in God, <laughs> I need the answer. <laughs> so, <laughs> that, and, uh, that, and I realized that this is a phenomenal opportunity to really share something that I'm tremendously passionate about and something that I was inspired to go into because I really saw it as a tool and a resource to ultimately help save my people, um, to help mm. equip us. With, with knowledge and with information to make informed health decisions. Um, so back to your question, what is genetic counseling? Um, genetic counseling is a process in which we help people understand information about their family health history, their personal health history. Um, and I always liken it to um, a game of Clue or um, doing detective work where oftentimes you're searching family histories and personal health histories for those clues that may serve as a red flag or alert us that, hey, there may be a potential DNA change um, in a patient or in a family that's causing the, the onset of certain diseases that we see occurring time and time after again in family members. Um, so genetic counselors, we really help demystify that big, bad, scary genetic information um, and really break it down in a way that hopefully everyone will be able to understand, everyone will feel empowered um, and be able to make the best decisions for themselves and for their family members. Wonderful. So, I mean, this, this is huge as it relates to, you know, health disparities and challenges, especially within the Black community. So, you know, what for you, and you've kind of spoken to it already, what really drew you to this specific field uh, of study? Yes. Um, again, I... I was a senior in college, so I learned about the field relatively late in my, um, my college tenure. Um, but for me, during that time, I was immersed in research and laboratory research. So it was just me and my pipettes and my Petri dishes. And, and I looked around and I was like, there's not a single person in here for me to talk to. And my Petri dishes aren't going to talk back. And if they do, then I really need to get out of here. Um, but I really missed that social interaction. And I had a love for medicine. I had a love for, for science. And at the time, um, the human genome had just been sequenced. And it was really touted as, as the next or as the, um, the best scientific advancement and breakthrough that was really going to benefit mankind. And as I looked at the news, and as I also watched the news and saw the statistics, um, about the disparities between Black women and white women diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, and during that time, and, and sadly, it's still the case today, um, white women were more likely to be diagnosed with breast cancer, but, but Black women were and still are more likely to die from breast cancer, um, even though we may be less likely to be diagnosed. And for me, I really saw genetics as a tool, as an asset to potentially help close that gap. Um, because at the time there was a test available where we could 
basically analyzed someone's DNA to see if they had changes in certain genes that we knew were associated with breast cancer, ovarian cancer, and other cancers. And if someone had a particular change in, for instance, their BRCA1 or BRCA2 genes, just to give examples, um, then there were specific steps and measures that we could take for those patients to help treat their breast cancer and to possibly even help prevent the onset of additional cancers in the future. So again, I saw it as a tool to, to help equip um, my, my community, the Black community and other underserved communities with information that was not readily at our fingertips and ultimately with information that could help us make informed decisions to help us possibly live longer lives and also empower our family members with information to help them manage their health and, and hopefully prevent disease as well. Wonderful. Wow. So, I mean, this is this is huge. And so in many ways, it's, it's an emerging field, right? It's, it's still kind of coming up. So this will kind of put you on the cutting edge. Do you do you know what is the percentage of African-Americans that are even doing the work that you, you're doing even more so? Like what percentage of like African-American women are, yeah. are doing this work? Yeah, so I'll leave by saying I'm sorry that I don't know the breakdown in terms of African American women, um, but you know our the statistics are um, they're disparaging still even um, within the profession of genetic counseling. So less than 10% of individuals in the profession identify as those of people of color or from underrepresented populations. So that means that 90% of the workforce, the genetic counseling workforce, identifies as white or of European ancestry. Um, and then when we focus on people who identify as Black or African American, only 2% um, of the workforce identifies as Black or African American. Um, but we are predominantly a female um, populated um, profession. Um, but unfortunately, I don't know the, the um, breakdown <laughs> stratified by Black women. Um, but definitely, yeah, definitely a work in progress. Um, but I'm really excited to be able to share that even within the past three years, I've seen tremendous progress in terms of the, um, the emergence and development of a network dedicated specifically to minority genetics professionals. Um, so we have what's called MGPN, the Minority Genetics Professional Network, and this is comprised of Black genetic counselors, other genetic counselors of, colors, of color, but also um, medical doctors and people with their PhD or other doctorate degrees in genetics as well. So it's allowed us to build that community that we desperately needed because it's one thing to be immersed in the profession, um, but but there's a, it's another thing to feel affirmed in the profession and actually want to stay in the profession. So I'm so thankful for MGPN and also thankful for the recent investments um, from various companies um, in a number of our historically Black colleges and universities with medical schools um, to actually develop genetic counseling programs. Um, so hopefully within the next five to 10 years, we will see a genetic counseling program at all of our historically Black colleges and universities with medical and graduate training programs. Wonderful. And, and, and I, that was something I wanted to ask. Like, so currently does the, the field of genetics, does that sit in the medical profession or is that a, a different, does it sit someplace differently in educational spaces? Yeah, so it really depends. I would say that um, genetics is really a diverse specialization. So you have some people who go on to become clinicians, such as genetic counselors um, or medical geneticists. So those are individuals who have their, their MD. Um, but you also have geneticists who work in laboratories or who work at um, some of our, whether they're clinical laboratories where they are testing blood samples or tissue samples for the various changes in the DNA. Um, and then you also have various individuals in the in the academic setting as well. So professors who are teaching the next cadre of um, geneticists and, and individuals in the genomic workforce as well. So, so we're really everywhere. Wonderful, wonderful. So what are some of the companies or places that you have been working uh, or who you've been working with? Yeah, so I've, I've actually had the opportunity to work um, in a variety of different spaces. Um, so I started my career in the academic um, space. So shortly after graduating from Howard University, the real HU, um, I went on. <laughs> 
I went on to do a postdoc at Johns Hopkins. Um, so there I was in an academic setting, but first and foremost, always centered the community and the needs of the community because I, I was determined to make sure that as genetics continued to advance, we were not leaving behind the populations that had been medically underserved or even medically mistreated um, for, for decades and centuries. Um, so while in the academic setting, I realized that I really wanted to have more direct patient contact. Um, so that inspired me to actually go into a hospital setting and work as a cancer genetic counselor. Um, so yeah, cancer um, genetics, it's so funny when I started my genetic counseling training, it was the last on the list because I, I did not want to be um, surrounded um, by various specializations, various oncology specializations. And I just thought that it would be a profession where I would not be able to contribute, but um, I had no idea that it would be the specialization that really called and affirmed like my presence and my purpose in this space. Um, so after leaving Hopkins, I went to Noonan, Georgia, so right outside of Atlanta, Georgia, where I worked at Cancer Treatment Centers of America um, and had the pleasure of, of serving so many patients from various states and even various countries and really serving as a valuable resource to my fellow um, my fellow professions as well. So various doctors, nurses, um, and other clinicians to help educate them about the value of genetics in their practice and in their ability to better meet the needs of their patients. Um, and then shortly after leaving Cancer Treatment Centers of America, I actually, that's when I moved to California. So that's when I connected with the Emanuel family. Um, I was drawn to Silicon Valley where I worked at a company called 23andMe, um, mm. which is a company yeah, a company that equips people with information about their ancestry, their heritage, um, but it also provides health information and health insights as well. Um, and I served in the capacity of a medical science liaison. So that just simply meant that I went from serving as a cancer genetic counselor where I treated patients and I talked to patients to serving in the capacity of someone who would teach and talk more to healthcare providers, doctors, nurses, to help educate them about genetics um, the various tests that were available and to ensure that they understood the limitations of the test um, as well. Um, so for me, that was an opportunity to broaden my reach and to ultimately reach more patients um, through healthcare providers. Um, so I was there for about two and a half years. And then that's when I was actually um, led to join Genentech, which is also in the San Francisco um, area, a biotech company um, immersed in pharma. So I can say during the pandemic, I, I was able to pursue a dream job um, where I joined the global health equity and population science team at Roche Genentech. Um, and, and it's been a, a great journey thus far just to be able to finally be able to combine, combine everything that I'm immensely passionate about into one profession um, where I finally get paid to do what I love um, and I, I get to do it day in and day out and I don't have to stay up and like volunteer my time to do it, but I actually get to do it on the clock. So it's great. That's amazing. Amazing. So, I mean, th there's just so much. I mean, I'm, I'm bubbling over with joy just to, number one, to hear the story. I mean, to see somebody on the, the cutting edge of a new field kind of emerging with so many of the possibilities that it's had. But I can only imagine being on the cutting edge, doing the work. There are probably been some challenges along the way. Um, what challenges have you faced in, in, in your field and in your growing success? Yes. And this is where I ask you, how much time do we have left in the interview? Because <laughs> I'm approaching 12 for 45 minutes about that. Um, in terms of the challenges that I, I faced and, you know, at the time, as I was going through those challenges, they were they were unbearable. Um, but it was definitely my faith that kept me grounded and helped me work through the challenges. Um, and also now I'm so you know, I can look back and I'm grateful for some of those challenges that I endured because they made me the person that I am today in terms of the resilience, in terms of the courage to speak up and, and even to ask some of the questions in my field that other people are afraid to ask or, or just are determined not to ask. 
Um, but, you know, some of the challenges that I encountered um, throughout my career include things as simple as um, when I was at Howard University enrolled in a master's level um, genetic counseling training program. Um, it was actually during my cancer genetic counseling rotation that I made so many unsettling and disturbing observations that I realized that my interest and my passion was more so aligned with the PhD at the time. Um, so I, I went to the director of my program, um, expressed to him my interest, my observations, and he was 150% supportive of me transitioning directly into a doctoral program. Um, and for me, I saw it as an opportunity to maximize my impact and in, in my ability to help change the field and, and really address some of the, the disparities and inequities um, that that I, I observed within the space. Mm -hmm. um, what I did not know at that time was that by directly transitioning from a master's level program to a doctoral level program, that years later, I would be told that you don't have a master's degree in the field of genetic counseling. You cannot take the certification exam to become a certified genetic counselor. I did not know that at the time, um, but that you was- You have a PhD, but not a master's, right? Yeah, your, your PhD isn't good enough. We don't recognize <laughs> it. You can go back and get a master's degree. You can take all the courses you took again, um, and then we'll let you take our exam. Um, so that was definitely a challenge and barrier that I, I did not anticipate. Um, and then to add insult to injury around that time, um, the board that, that informed me that I could not take the test, they also sent me a cease and desist letter. So they, they had a lawyer <laughs> send me a letter um, informing me that I needed to remove language from my employer's website that suggested that I was eligible to take the board examination. Um, so, you know, it, there were just a lot of different curveballs coming at me at once. Um, and again, had it not been for my faith, had it not been for the phenomenal support network that God put in front of me, I, I don't know what I would have done. Um, because you know, I, I never questioned transitioning from a master's level program to a doctoral level program. And I always knew that I was doing it to be of greater service to others. Yeah. Um, but yeah. to encounter those challenges um, a couple of years afterwards, it was definitely, you know, I, I, incur I encountered my moments of depression. Um, but again, so grateful for, for my faith, so grateful for my supportive network who helped pull me through and helped support me. Um, and happy to report that I was finally able to take that examination. Didn't pass okay. it the first time. So that, <laughs> you know, that also added to the challenges, um, but eventually passed it. And after I passed it, I, like there was no questioning that people could not tell me that, that that genetic counseling was not my purpose and that addressing the inequities, disparities, and the bias in the field um, was not part of my calling. So and this is actually where I will pull on um, Ms. Belson's interview, which was so touching, and I can't wait to reconnect with her. Um, so in college, I, I walked through the doors of college thinking pre-med, oh, I want to be a doctor. And I'll also share, um, it's it's because I was limited in the various career options that were available to me at the time. Um, but, you know, my family was pushing me to become a doctor. I couldn't be a politician, so you can become a doctor. Um, and I struggled in my biology courses at Rhodes College. Um, you know, there might have been about 20 of us Black students who started on the path of biology, but, the, but at the end of four years, there were two or three of us remaining. And those of us who remain, you know, we had been tested and, and tried and we suffered from imposter syndrome and we were told, you know, that we didn't deserve to be there and we weren't smart. Um, but for me, it's because of programs such as the Henry McNair, um, because of the McNair program, which really helps to build and cultivate um, the next cadre of Black scientists, those who go on to pursue their PhDs um, in the scientific sphere. It's because of those types of programs and support networks um, that, you know, I, I saw it through and that I realized 
I'm not the only one who is enduring these challenges, you know, while I'm enrolled in school or, or, you know, I have my sights on maybe becoming a medical doctor. And there are other students like me at other universities who are enduring the same challenges, but we are equally as motivated and we're all here for the same reasons. Um, so being able to identify those peer mentors, my tribe, um, and then also those programs such as the McNair program, um, and others, those those are what kept me inspired as well. And I realized I said Henry McNair, I was combining Henry Turner, the school that I worked at, and Ronald McNair. But when I heard um, Sister Belson talk about the fact that she went to school with Ronald McNair and applied to become an astronaut, and I was like, I, I ended up ultimately pursue or knowing the PhD was an option because of the Ronald McNair program. Prior to that, I had never heard of the PhD. I was immersed in a laboratory doing research, but my advisors never talked to me about other doctorate degrees. Yeah. Um, they barely yeah. talked to me about the MD, but let alone didn't <laughs> PhD to me. So, yeah. Wow. <laughs> so like, that's crazy. Like you got a PhD and they're like, that's not, that's not good enough. Like, <laughs> oh yes. They were like that. No, we do not recognize your PhD. <laughs> And, and you know what, something else I forgot to speak to, even when I was a cancer genetic counselor in a hospital setting, there were some colleagues who were like, we're not going to call you Dr. Ewing. Um, and they started a whole movement with that. And the crazy thing is, I walked through the doors of that hospital not wanting to be called Dr. Ewing. And my very first patient, I will never forget, um, she's a woman um, from Trinidad, and she's, she's a doctor. And after my time with her, I handed her my card, and she said, oh, you're a doctor. And I was like, yes, but I'm not comfortable using a title. And she looked at me, and she said, I don't care what you're comfortable with. Like, you worked hard. You earned this. Your family sacrificed for it. You are Dr. Ewing. And I was like, yes, ma'am. I'm Dr. Ewing. <laughs> so yeah and then to have colleagues you know we're not calling you doctor you don't have a medical degree I'm like I never asserted that I did have a medical degree so yeah, yeah. Wow, wow so um you know I, I had a couple other questions but it seems like we've led into this one already so I'm jumping so you, you know you kind of talked about how faith has led you through some of the challenging times right mm -hmm. um have there been any other ways that faith has played an important role just in your success so far? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, it's been core to everything that I've done. Um, even in terms of, I mentioned earlier, at times I'm in spaces where there's a particular conversation that's going on and it may be a conversation that is not the most inclusive. Um, mm -hmm. It's not necessarily a conversation that serves everyone and, and it may actually serve like the same populations and patients over and over again. Um, but just being grounded in my faith and affirmed in my faith that, you know, I'm, I'm going to be bold, I'm going to be courageous, and I'm going to speak up, and I'm going to ask a question that may change the momentum of the conversation, um, but I'm doing so because I'm affirmed that this is what God has put on my heart, and this is part of my calling, and this is part of the mission that I'm, I'm put here to complete. Um, so for me, my faith day in and day out affirms that, you know, I, I have to see this mi mission to completion. Um, and it's not something that I will ever be able to do on my own. Um, God is with me each and every step of the way. Um, and that's something that I am unafraid and unapologetic to share um, day in and day out. But yeah, there are too many challenges that I endure day in and day out um, in this space that I, I would not have made it on my own for sure. Absolutely. So, you know, with this still being a, a emerging field, a space where maybe a number of folks that may be watching may not know, what would you hope people remember? What, what do you want them to know about genetics? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, I want them to know that genetics is fun. Um, and it's something that um, everyone can talk about and everyone should talk about. And it starts with something as simple as like our family history. Um, so knowing our heritage, knowing um, the royalty that's in our lineages, knowing um, 
knowing your family history will ultimately help us better understand our genetics because that really unlocks the door for us to understand our health history. Um, mm -hmm. Connecting the dots between family history and family health history, that's how we make informed health decisions. That's how we pass on information to our loved ones so that mm -hmm. they can be more informed, so that they have more options, so that they have options sooner um, to help manage their risk for various conditions or even precise nicely treat um, the various conditions that they are diagnosed with. Um, so mm -hmm. that, that's something that I want people to know about genetics. Um, and there are so many different professions that you could pursue um, where you can really be engaged in, in genetics work day in and day out. If you wanted to work in a community setting, um, that's an option for you. In the public health space, um, there's a specialty called public health genomics. Um, there are individuals, again, who work in academic settings as professors. There are people in laboratories. Um, so really, options are endless. Um, and I encourage people not to be intimidated by, by the G word, genetics, um, <laughs> but again, to, to realize that it's something that, that it truly is fun and, and, um, and hopefully will become like a, a household conversation one day. Well, you know, totally unscripted. I, I'm, I'm going to ask you because I have you now. Like, I've always wanted to know more about like my my genetic history, my ancestry, and all of that. But I've actually been really nervous about giving that information away, especially to companies and how they use wow. them. Uh, what would you recommend to somebody that might sit in similar to me that has some concern about doing maybe doing 23andMe or Ancestry.com uh, with their genetic makeup? Yeah. So I want people to be encouraged and aware that you have options when you are looking into the various products at the genetic testing companies. Um, so read your informed consent, your paperwork carefully. And if you have questions about that paperwork, do not be afraid to pick up the phone and call the companies or to reach out to ask specific questions about the paperwork. Um, because the companies, they give individuals options um, to participate in research. So if you want your DNA to be used um, to advance science and, and to help um, the company or even companies that they partner with address various que scientific questions and, and develop therapeutics, that's something that you actively consent to. Or if you decide this isn't for me, then that's your choice as well. And also, if you say, I don't want to opt into this now, but maybe in a few years, I'll come back to it. That's an option okay. available to people as well. Um, so you're never coerced um, into anything. And if you decide to get your, um, your lineage tested today to do an ancestry test today, and then maybe a month from now, you say, I want this company to destroy my DNA and I do not want them to have access to it. That's your right. Mm -hmm. You can reach out to the company, but you have control of how your DNA is used. Um, so mm -hmm. don't be afraid to exert and exercise that control. Um, so that that's really what I want people to know, um, that there are rights and protections um, in place for consumers who are thinking about those products. So um, last couple of questions. I know that you have been published in a couple of journals, magazines, anything that you want to speak to, any of the work that you uh, have been published about in this field of genetics. Yeah, and I really should have spoken to that um, when you asked me about challenges that I experienced <laughs> and encounter in the profession too, because publishing has not been um, the easiest. It's not for the faint of heart. Um, there have been plenty of submissions where I received that denied um, letter um, and plenty of articles or manuscripts that I submitted and I had to submit to maybe five different journals until that article found a home. Um, but the majority of my work has really been centered around cancer health disparities, um, really discussing the differences and even the factors um, that influence populations of color's willingness to participate in cancer genetics research. Um, but I've also been able to um, engage in several interviews um, with like Oprah Magazine, Essence, Blavity. And that's where hopefully I'm able to talk about the profession of genetic counseling in a way that 
everyone will be able to understand and talk about genetic testing in a way that everyone can recognize, hey, this is something that I, I should ask my doctor about, or I can ask my doctor about to see if I'm eligible for testing. Or maybe if I'm not the right person in my family to be tested, maybe there's another person we should start testing first. Um, and really those interviews and the publications such as O Magazine, Essence, Blavity, those are some of the ones that mean the most to me because those are the ones that I know are in the hands of, of the communities that I care about. And, and again, the communities um, that really inspired me to start this work day in and day out. All right, and last question. Uh, man, you, you've done a lot already. What are you hoping to accomplish next? Oh, good question. Um, <laughs> so I'll start by sharing something, um, a conversation that I had with my dad, oh, 20 plus years ago. Um, I, and this was when I was in high school and I did not really know what I wanted to do at the time. Um, but I went to my dad and I said, daddy, I think I want to be a politician. And he said to me, you don't want to be a politician. Politicians are liars. And I'm not trying to offend any politicians who may be listening. <laughs> this is just what was communicated to me when I was in high school. Um, and, you know, you listen to your parents. Mm -hmm. Um but I, I grew, I got experience, I got exposure. And in the genetic space, I realized that there is actually an opportunity to combine science and policy to influence the laws of the land and to influence um, the regulations that touch the everyday person and touch local communities. Um, so for me, I really want to move into more of a policy sphere um, and that's because right now, the field of genetic counseling is not recognized by the centers of Medicaid and Medicare services, um, so by CMS. And that basically means that when a patient goes to the doctor, depending on your insurance, your genetic testing may or may not be covered um, based on the fact that CMS does not recognize genetic counseling. And I want to change that because again, I see this as a tool that can help us address disease, address inequities, and to equip people with information in a timely manner. And the way that we do that is through the profession of genetic counseling, through that resource. Um, so we actually, we as in the um, National Society of Genetic Counselors, we actually have a bill that we plan to reintroduce in the House and the Senate, um, access to genetic counseling services. And hopefully once that bill is passed, um, everyone will have access to genetic counseling and genetic testing and will not have to worry about the costs associated with it because your insurance providers and your payers will cover it. Um, so I want to move more so into that space and really espouse how by granting access to more um, patients and by um, granting payers the ability to cover genetic counseling, it may enable us to prevent more diseases and to really help eliminate some of the disparities that we see day in and day out. So that's definitely where I see myself moving um, within the next, well, now and, and continuing to be influential within the next few years. Let me say thank you. This has been informative. Like I'm, I'm far more engaged with the idea about genetics and what that could do uh, now. Thank you so much for taking time. Thank you for being a living legend, right? Um, and even the idea that that doesn't have to start just when you know we've lived a long, long life. Right? We don't have to be older, but we can start those things now. Um, and thank you for being one of those people that are doing that. So Yes. Thank yeah. you so much again for considering me. And again, um, it was very intimidating when I was asked. And even when I reflect on some of the living legends that you've interviewed to date, mm -hmm. I listen to those interviews and I'm like, I will probably have 15 minutes worth of answers to share with <laughs> Pastor Jason. And that's it. I'm going to be the most boring <laughs> interview ever. Um, but but I've really enjoyed it. I've enjoyed it a lot more than I anticipated. And, and I just hope that I can see some interest um, and maybe a future genetic counselor or interest in a patient or family um, in, in genetics and in genetic counseling and testing. Um, so I do encourage people, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me and I'm happy to share my, my contact information for sure. Wonderful, wonderful. We'll make sure we definitely put that uh, on, our, on, on the end. Folks can reach out to you. I'm praying that young boys, young girls will be able yes. to see you, someone that looks like them 
and say, man, this is something I could do. Uh, when we see ourselves, then all of a sudden we can see ourselves. And so um, really excited about that. Thank you all uh, for coming to this uh, episode of Living Legends. It has been absolutely an honor to talk with Altavis Ewing, PhD. <laughs> <laughs> all right, you all. God bless. Thank you. <clears throat>